one of the, the things that happened this year, we saw a spike in what we call UCPVs. A lot of people call them auto thefts. Those went up. We put people in jail. So we have a lot of people in our jails right now um, for auto theft. And again, those crimes went down. You know, um, a lot of people say, well, how come, you guys probably have a whole bunch of questions for me, questions about bail, how can people get released, and what's going on in our island? I'm going to send you guys, if, if you're interested, Hawaii Department of Public Safety. They have a website under the corrections. It gives you the current count of who's incarcerated. So I just want to show you what's going on in our island. Um, HCCC is the first one that comes up. Yeah. Yeah. You guys okay without the mic? Yeah. Okay, so HCCC is the first one that comes up on this, uh, on this web page. And it's basically Department of Public Safety for Hawaii, go to corrections, and then they have their count. The latest count was November. Design bed capacity is 206. Current bed capacity, oh, excuse me. Design bed capacity is 206. Operational bed capacity is 226. Current capacity, 402. That, that's a problem. We have more people than we can put in. So a lot of people say, how come these guys keep on getting released? Well, there's no place to keep them. A lot of these people are pretrial felons. Most of these people are pretrial felons and felons, according to, to this website. Very few misdemeanors um, or petty misdemeanors. Now, I, I see my friend Roger Christie up here. Uh, Roger is a, a marijuana advocate. You know a lot of people in, you know, who go through, through marijuana issues. Uh, in the state jails right now, or prisons, can you give me any one name of someone who's in jail or prison for marijuana offense? But not in state, that's a federal prison. In state. So I, I don't put people in federal prison, we don't put people in county prison in, in state. So you hear all these people talk about, oh, these marijuana guys, they're, they're clogging our jails. I, I don't know a single name. We, we have a room full of people, we have some marijuana advocates here, they don't need, know a single name. You saw the paper today, it's talked about marijuana and the prosecutors are going to have to decide. That's not me. That's the federal prosecutors that decide. And the reason why it's the federal prosecutors deciding because the federal prosecutors have control over the federal enforcement officers, the DEA, the FBI, and all those guys. So I just want to make, make sure we have this clarity of what's going on. Do I prosecute? Do we prosecute people for marijuana offenses? Occasionally we do. Uh, my job is to enforce the laws as they're written. Uh, is it our main priority? It really isn't. It's not the thing that we're really looking at. What really scares me with the things that are going on right now isn't marijuana, but it is the opioid epidemic that's hitting the rest of the United States. It has not hit us yet to the effect that it's hitting other places. The state of Ohio last year had over 3,000 people that OD died from opioids. There's this thing called fentanyl uh, that is out there. Fentanyl is, if you're going for an operation, they're probably going to put fentanyl in your, in your system. Um, it is the synthetic fentanyl, the stuff coming through China, through Mexico, that's coming in, that people are, are overdosing and dying. I was talking to Dr. Hannah from ISAC, and uh, you know what we see on the mainland is these guys start with heroin and other opioids and, and then they're getting into the fentanyl. Um, we're getting our heroin from the same places that a lot of these people are coming, are getting in from. So it's going to start hitting us. It's cheap and <coughs> a lot of drugs do fuel our drug, our, our other crime problem. So Dr. Hannah, I think we asked this question a couple of months ago of you. What percentage of the people do you see? Right now it's actually secondary for individuals that are coming into treatment. So, uh, and I would say about maybe 30%. 30%. And how many people do you guys see at any one time? Um, we have about maybe 150 on our census daily. So 1,400 individuals yearly. That's a really scary number. And Is that heroin? Are you that's the same heroin or fentanyl? What, 
They're opioid. 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 Yeah. You know, they're different. Oh. They're all seats on the Titanic. They're all. They're all taking you down. So there's some scary stuff that's happening. Um, so you know, we look at the things that are happening. We try to think about how we can be more proactive than reactive. I see my friend Kat Brady. Kat, I asked you this question. If you knew anybody sitting in jail right now, any person, any names of anybody I marijuana? I don't want to take any of your time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are addressing crimes. You know, we get about 20,000 cases, maybe 17 to 20,000 cases a year come through our office. Not all of those are felonies. A lot of those are misdemeanors, petty misdemeanor cases. Um, there's a lot of cases. A lot of the people that are sitting in our jails right now are sitting in our jails. They're waiting for trials to happen. Um, we have, you know, for the last year, we were down a judge. Uh, we're down a judge in Kona. We just got a second judge there. Um, with everything that's going on in our state, there's a, there's a task force, and I actually sit on this task force with all the other prosecutors. We're looking at how many people are sitting in jails waiting trials. And you know, the interesting thing is, there's a lot of people in Hawaii that are waiting trials, but Hawaii is probably has the lowest pre-trial detention rate of any other state. Uh, there's a, a study that they put out last year. We looked at the numbers. They do it per 100,000. We're less than 100 people per 100,000. Uh, as what we figured out. So, Kat, I hope that we can talk about that. Kat, um, she's going to come talk to you in a little bit. She'll, she'll talk about some of the things that they're working on. We often are on opposite sides of the aisle. Sometimes we're on the opposite sides of the aisle with Roger, but a lot of times we're on the same side of the aisle when we look at being more proactive and going upstream. What do I mean by going upstream? We know that Throughout the United States, you're seeing a lot of problems in juvenile justice, a lot of juvenile crimes, a lot of these, these crimes, like in Baltimore and St. Louis, and all these places where kids are out of control. What do you think is going on with juvenile crime in the state of Hawaii? More, more, for, more, more importantly, in this, on this island, our juvenile crime is down by over 50%. I want to introduce you, Lisa Falconanoi from my office. Please raise your hand. Lisa's been in charge of a, of a program uh, through our office that funds uh, this group called BIJAC. It's actually under the Salvation Army. BIJAC is the Big Island Juvenile Intake and Assessment Center. What would happen is the police would go out and they would arrest people and it would take about a year for that case to get into court. Why is that? Juveniles can only be held for a certain amount of time. Officers release them. They send the case to uh, not our office first, but to Family Court Probation. They review them. They send them to our office. We review them. We send them back to Family Court Probation, who then gets a word out to the kid. The kids come into court, and that takes a lot of time. <coughs> we send kids, and you're going to love this, cat, because you probably don't know this. How much, well, maybe you do know this, how much does it cost to incarcerate one child for a year in the state of Hawaii? $196,000. It's now over $200,000 to incarcerate one child per year in the state of Hawaii. And what is our recidivism rate? Recidivism is the rate in which they reoffend. What's our recidivism rate for, for juveniles? So this is a number we have to really look at. Our juvenile recidivism rate is somewhere around 75% from HYCF, the Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility. At, we'll take your figure, $196,000. That's a 25% success rate. For anybody who's a student, if you get a 25 on your grade, say, hey, I'm doing just as good as the criminal justice system. <laughs> uh, with BiJack, it costs us about $250,000 for a year. We see over 300 kids. I think the figure is how much per kid? About $750 to maybe $1,000 per kid. Yeah. Our recidivism rate from BiJack, last year, what was it? 6%. 6%! That means there's a 94% success rate. There's a reason why, what's going on. We also do, I see Becky over here, one of our volunteers working on restorative justice. And restorative justice, you do the uh, victim offender dialogues. And so what, what happens in the victim offenders, you have a victim, you have an offender, you have someone who gets down, works together with them. They decide on what the consequence is going to be. Am I saying this right? The two sides on opposite sides of the table talking to each other instead of courtroom. Instead of occupying a bunch of taxpayer dollars and the judge, and prosecutor, etc., the 
victim gets to talk to the offender and they come up with a plan on how they're going to make it right. And generally, the victims that you've dealt with, you know, first of all, they don't get into this program unless the victim wants to be in the program, right? Correct. How satisfied have the victims that you've dealt with uh, been? Well, I haven't victim, asked those questions. Like, no, the victims, what I see is the victims are relieved because not only did they get to resolve the issue, but they found out how the victim felt. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the offender. The offender finds out how the victim felt. And the victim gets to tell their story, not to the prosecutor or to an attorney, but to the offender himself or herself. And they get to say, this is how it affected me. This is how it affected my family. This is how I felt. But not only that, they get to see their, the offender's face. They get to see that this isn't some scary individual. This is just a person. This is a person who has a story. And the victim has a story. They both get to tell their stories. And in the end, it truly is a healing. That's another way of going upstream and start getting into working with these kids. With BiJack, they send them to programs early. They go from the police station to BiJack. BiJack gets them into a program. And then there's some consequences that come. Oftentimes, if they do, when they go, even when they go to court, they're getting consequences. But they've already gone through those, those consequences and they've already done those things. Um, Another thing we're doing, I'll just share this, I know we have some volunteers from Camp Agape. And uh, anybody heard of Camp Agape? So Camp Agape is a camp for kids whose parents are incarcerated. Put on mostly by the churches, we help support them in whatever way we can. Um, a four day camp, first, first day they're talking about uh, trust, uh, second day is love, third day forgiveness, fourth day hope and prayer. Um, why is the prosecutor getting involved in that? That's kind of like, it sounds like a division of church and state. Well, you know, they're doing what they're doing. We're recognizing that these kids who are going through these programs, there's a lot of problems that they've been going through. And if somebody doesn't get in their life and turn them around, then you're going to see a lot of problems. So we're seeing these kids who would never be thinking about going to college, getting going to college, being successful, doing things. So that's the kind of things we're doing to try to go upstream. We have a SAMHSA-gram, a SAMHSA-gram, <laughs> federal drug uh, <laughs> grant, where we're trying to bring people together and work on our treatment facilities. You know, one of the things that's happened, a lot of people talk about, we need to not incarcerate people. I still think we still need to incarcerate people. I'm sorry. Uh, but if you're not going to incarcerate them, we need to get them into treatment plans. Because we know a lot of our drug people are breaking the law. The problem is, Dr. Hannah, what's your waiting list? Oh, our waiting list is anywhere, depending on how. Uh -huh. how many? 40, 40 individuals so, for how three homes. Waiting list to get into those houses. 40. 40 days. 40, 40 people, people, 40 individuals. Uh, on the waiting list, but how yes. long? Oh, I would say about maybe anywhere from, depending, you know, we could have some discharges. Maybe about, maybe about 45 days, 60 days. So, so that's, that's a problem. You know, we talk about doing all these things where we're going to get people into treatment, but if you can't get them into treatment at the right times, that's a big problem. And what about juveniles? Do you guys, you, uh, you know, inpatient juveniles. Do you guys have any inpatient juveniles here? Bobby Benson on Oahu, and, and what's the waiting list for that? It's the only juvenile treatment place in the state. Yeah, what's the waiting a, list? Uh, I don't know. It's got 25 beds, though, so it's a big list. So if you're going to do anything about We have these conversations, you know, with the legislature. You know, right now, we have some big issues that we're facing. I, I know that there's a lot of things going on that you see the, the, the high-profile crime. Last year, we had a whole bunch of people who were coming out of um, prison gangs on the mainland, La, La Familia, uh, getting into shootings with the police. Those, all those people were kind of the same kind of things uh, going on. The problems that we're having now are less, we're not seeing that kind of stuff. We still see stuff, and uh, there was something that was brought up by the police, and I just want to touch on this. Big Island Thieves, how many of you guys are on Big Island Thieves or stolen stuff away or, or, or everything? You know, I love and hate that site at the same time. <laughs> 
great thing about what's happening with Big Island Thieves is you have people talking to each other and there are things that are happening because people are talking to each other. The bad thing is there's just a lot of BS on there. Um, and, you know, and it's people who are talking. And you know what, what amazes me is sometimes we do this and I don't put this on there. We, we look at people's you know, Facebook accounts and we look at Big On Thieves and we, we see, hey, this is the guy we're looking for. Right? <laughs> with that. Um, so. Uh, yes. Okay, we don't, we don't, we're not going to allow for oral questions. Could you write well, well, it down? I, I think, why are we giving more people the opportunity to get outpatient treatment waiting to go to inpatient? Okay, so That's the problem. I, okay, so we have people who are going to address your issues, okay. and I love, I, love, I love this town hall, right. but we have four hours, okay? okay? And there's a lot of people who don't want to wait the entire four hours, so please write down your question, and you can talk to him directly outside. Okay, but, but that's a great question to have out in the air. What was I mean, there's, it? A lot of, there's a lot of questions of, of why are we, and, and I, I can explain all of our problems in this one simple, Joy, don't take offense to this, okay? But I, I have to explain. It works the same way in Washington, D.C. that the Potomac goes around the Washington, D.C. We have this mode of water that goes around our state capital. A lot of people don't realize this. But in both of those places, there's negative ions that suck the common sense out of your head. <laughs> Sorry, <go ahead. laughs> Never confuse common sense with government from your government uh, employee here. I want to touch on one thing that the police didn't put up, um, how to really be a good witness is if you can write a statement, you know, it's so much better, I, and I wish the police officers were still... They are, they're still outside. Well, let, me, let me get one of them real quick. Okay, we, you have <laughs> 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, so... Okay, and that includes questions. When, when you say, Davey, Davey, you have your little pad that you write your notes on? You have people talking to you. You have your little pad that you write your notes on? So when, when, when you take a police report, you have... A notebook. A notebook. <laughs> And my mic is. So now you know I work because you see all of that. Now look the reporter. Look the reporter. He's got one that's a little bit bigger, but he gets to call back. So you make a statement to an officer. And how many cases do you, do you think you take in, in one night? Oh, depending on the, the beat area that you have your assigned to. So, I mean, that could be from. Oh, okay, so I have to be talking for my full time. Did you guys get everything down that I was saying? Because if he's taking notes in here, how accurate do you think his notes are yeah, going to be? Yeah. Right. So I, I, I want you to think about this, because this is really important for if you're a juror or if you're a witness. Ask the officer if you can write down a statement, because he's going to go back. When are you going to dictate your, your reports for that day? When, when I have the time to. Which is generally when? At, almost at the end of the shift. Okay, so. You may have talked to him eight hours ago. He's put some little notes in there. He may remember things. He may get things wrong. Yeah. You can see how this, this happens. What happens now, you're a witness. You come to court, and you told the officer this, didn't you? That's not exactly what I told him. No, it's not what I told him. So now, the defense attorney says, OK, who's lying? The officer or the witness? Neither of them are lying. They're not lying. They just... I like how you're using me as an example. <laughs> So if you have a chance, no, no, but one more thing, one more thing, when you're up on the stand, think about this, now, now think about this, when you're up, you've testified before, mm -hmm. and have you ever had these opportunities where you're testifying, you don't remember everything that's in your report, and what, do you, and what do you say? If I can refer to my notes. If I can refer to my notes, he can refer to his notes, you know why he can refer to them? Because he wrote them. If you're a witness, and he took down your notes, you didn't write those notes, they're not your notes, you can't refer to those notes. But the reason why is sometimes we get subpoenaed to court, a court case, months, maybe a year down the road. So the, the incident is not as fresh in our, our memory. It's not going to be fresh in your memory either. So okay. if you have the opportunity, write them down, write them down because that will make you a much better witness. They should the have last, form, and email it to somebody. The last thing I'm going to say. <laughs> send it to me and I'll send out the newsletter. The, the last thing I, I, I'm going to share, and I, I usually share this with, with town hall meetings, is a quote by Sir Robert Peel. Sir Robert Peel is the father of modern day police. Sir Robert Peel is the guy who they named the police officers in London. The Bobbies, the Peelers, 
same thing. Uh, coppers has nothing to do with short rod peel, had to do with the copper button. Now they make them out of plastic, so they call them the popo. <laughs> so far, their, their, their buttons are made out of plastic. Short <laughs> <laughs> peel said this, the police are the public, the public are the police, but the police being the only members of society that are paid to do what's incumbent upon every citizen. So, you know, if you're not happy about what's happening, don't just point fingers. Get involved. There's, you know, and that's why I really do love like the Big Island Thieves page because people are getting involved. They're trying to be a part of the solution. There's a lot of solutions that we need, um, and it doesn't happen just by us coming up with ideas. It comes up with everybody. So I know you have questions. For okay. Me. So the first question is: of all of the front page articles, do we in the public need to be concerned? about any rise in violent crime here in Puma? So, I can't specifically talk about these things, but I can tell you that in general, in Hawaii, on this island in general, most of the crime are people who know people, that have relationships with people. Uh, I, I usually talk about kids coming from homes of domestic violence, because that's going to be one of your big indicators. Um, kids coming from homes of domestic violence, more likely to commit suicide. 40%, 50% likelihood to have drug abuse, addiction problems, alcohol problems, you know, drug or alcohol, um, likely to be homeless. And when your kids are at school getting in fights, you as a parent say, oh, those kids are hanging around with. Well, where do those kids come from? They probably come from homes domestic violence if they're not your kid, uh, right? So th that's kind of where these cases are coming from. Okay, so the, um, are they, do you know what, I know you can't comment, but do you notice whether or not there's any increase in crime based upon any of the prisoners that we had brought back from Arizona or the mainland? We have seen a lot of violent crimes coming out of mainland uh, prisons, especially those ones that enter those prison gangs. Um, there are some people that have come back from, from Arizona and uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in faith. One of the things that they have in Arizona, they have faith pods, which include like a Hawaiian pod, they have one for you know Christianity, whatever it is. They're putting like people together, and you know, it, I think of it like a diet. You want to you know, go on a diet, but you know, your, your buddy is eating chocolates, and come on, come on, come on, versus everybody on the same diet together and kind of pushing you forward. So there are some good things that we can learn from what they're doing in Arizona. There's also some, some negative stuff that's come out of that. Okay, so um, one last thing, and I know there's a bunch of these questions, and I think we're going to be, um, hopefully by the speakers, we'll be able to answer them. If not, let us know what questions that you have given us that were not answered. Give us your email. We'll email you if we're not, if we can't answer it directly. But the other thing is, um, do you notice whether or not there's any rise in crime based upon homelessness or squatters? Other than the trespass caused by the squatters. So, you know, we've been working a lot with squatters from our office. It's really not our office's, you know, thing. Um, but nobody else was doing it. I had a guy, Maurice Messina, who was doing such a good job that Park stole them and made him their number two, okay, double the salary. So now, yeah. so, uh, I'm trying to fill that position. Um, you know, that wasn't his official job to work on squatters, but we came up with, you know, some uh, strategies there to help work on that situation. We're still working on those on those things. Right now, I just have a shortage of people. Homeless, a lot of people have to realize that not all homeless people are criminals, and especially not all homeless people in the criminal justice system are criminals. A lot of homeless people end up being victims. Well, 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 yeah. a lot of them end up being victims. And if you look and you understand, I know Brandy's going to talk to you about, you know, our homeless. A lot of, a lot of people are there because it's expensive to, to live in, you know, just the, the situations that they've gotten into. Um, so, you, I mean, just because someone's homeless, homelessness is not a crime. It's something that we have because we haven't done a good job as, as a, as a community, society to um, work on that situation. Okay, so um, somebody asked about repeat offenders, misdemeanors, criminals, 
know that they can get away without jail time or fine? Are, are you seeing any repeat offender misdemeanors? You know, most of the people that we are incarcerating um, are repeat offenders because it is very hard, especially for property crimes or like your methamphetamine or, or other drug crimes, it's almost impossible to get a jail, you know, prison sentence on them. Uh, so most, most of them are repeat offenders. And, and you know, some people say that may be the way it should be. Um, the, the problem is, is you get people that get to this system, and especially the juveniles, that, that you know, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. Now they got a whole bunch of things happening, and they're in prison. Oh, damn. I didn't know that was going to happen. Well, eventually going to happen. But it's hard for us to get prison uh, unless they, they're repeat offenders. But um, next up is Brandy. Okay, Brandy Manila. 